facilitating discussion that includes everyone and holds everyone accountable for thinking. I, I talked about Mrs. McKim, my grade 11 English teacher, and she got this. She got how do you create a thinking environment within the classroom that holds every student accountable for thinking. Mrs. McKim was not the quiz master. Mrs. McKim, we did not see her as she's the lady with all the answers to the questions. She's read the books, we have, but she understands them better than us. So she knows what this short story means. She knows the theme of this novel. She knows, etc. No, not at all. Mrs. McKim was about, I need to put the onus for thinking on my students because they're the ones here to learn, not me. And that's key. So, a few things that we can do, and I'm sure many of these techniques you're already doing. Just find ways, if there's one thing you do differently when you leave here today, and I'm sorry, I'm making assumptions here, but if you still ask questions and wait for kids to put their hands up, change that one thing. Change that one thing with a no hands rule. And then everything changes, because we know that the kids who put their hands up are always the ones who've got it. So we need to find alternatives to uh, that oral questioning that involves kids putting up their hands. So things like asking the question, no hands, turn to a partner, form a group, and then someone from each group venturing, uh, here's what we think. Those kinds of things. So the no hands rule can really, really help. Giving the class, not just giving, demanding thinking time on the part of the whole class before you get feedback from them in terms of response. If we still have, following their think-pair-share activity, we still have, okay, from this group, a hand went up, this group has decided such and such about, about this particular uh, article we just read. What we then must do is avoid the judgment. Instead of, well done, excellent, or nice try. <laughs> How about, who agrees with that? What do the rest of you think about, I'm going to pick on, what's your name, please? So Carol gave kind of a, our group summarized by thinking this. Carol says, thank you, Carol. Interesting. Appreciate that. Or maybe I'd ask another question. How did your group get there? But I suspend the, uh, the evaluative judgment. I then put it to the rest of you. So what, what, what do the rest of you think about uh, uh, that group's thinking? All right. So who agrees with, with it's Carol? Right? See, here's my, sorry, brain cramp number one. Uh, who agrees with Carol? Interesting, we've got a, di a difference of opinion over here. Um, let's say, your name please? Russian. 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 So who agrees with, with, with Russian's group? Interesting. So how do we resolve this? And it's we, students, not me resolving it. And so anything we can do to create that, but the critical thing is, we've maybe done some of that before, but is everybody involved? Do we hold everybody accountable for doing the thinking, including the kids who they kind of maybe in the past have, have, have sort of hidden in the background, never put their hand up, uh, hope and pray that you never ask them a question, etc. So how do we involve everybody in that? Okay, this has got to be the goal. Now, we need to be purposeful around that. We need, if we've got a clear learning goal, we can make sure that the discussion is purposeful. It's not going to go the whole 70 minutes. You've probably got colleagues who the kids have them round, uh, wound around their little fingers in terms of, oh, we can get Miss Jones going, you know. So she loves discussion. And then, and then boom, boom, end of the period, can't believe it. So we do need to put some time limits on that. We do need to have a clear learning goal in terms of we want students to consider the following kinds of perspectives with respect to this issue. Um, but that is so, so important. Facilitating discussion that includes everyone and holds everyone accountable for thinking.